Like, oh man, I'm turning into a vampire. <laughs> Funny you should mention that. <laughs> so, we're off to the races, at least. Let's see. Double check. I'm always so paranoid. I've had a few software glitches. I don't know if you watched all the interviews on my channel, but I've had a few times where the software glitched on me and I had errors come up after the fact. And it's just and now I'm always paranoid when I have everything up. I'm like, is it really I, up? You just don't. You never know what you're getting because you're in it. You know. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I, so. I do. A, I do a podcast about um, paranormal travel with my daughter and a couple times we've had a guest and it's like oh my gosh you just can't control that yeah <laughs> yep it is and you know it'd be one thing too if i like had any kind of formal education or training in uh software and how different programs link up and hardware optimization and that kind of stuff but i'm just a guy <laughs> so. oh, come on and it changes all the time anyway, so... Exactly. It's like, if you're not constantly... You have to follow this stuff pretty much by the hour. It's yeah. crazy. So, My brother used to work at Microsoft, and he would say, Internet security? Are you kidding me? It's never going to happen. So I could <laughs> Because they, the hack, hackers just catch up all the time. Yep. Yep. It's a rapidly evolving world, to be sure. <sighs> so... Uh, that's the third time I've said that. <laughs> you are Patri pa Patricia Simpson, author of Apothecary, and I went to your website, and you mm -hmm. actually have a bunch of stuff published. You have a pretty decent catalog of uh, work that is to market, and I can only assume most of it, if not all of it, is pretty get pretty darn good based on the one novel I've read so far. <laughs> so. Well, thank you, Zach. Yeah, I mean, I really, I really enjoyed it. It was, it, it's up there in, uh, in, it's, and you know, especially what really struck me too was I'm not a big vampire guy. That's not one of my preferred genres, especially to read, but I really enjoyed this because it was well done and there was plenty of story elements outside of the, we got vampires that made it interesting and made it appealing. Um, it was, uh, I think I tried to have it be more of a different race. It was a racial problem more than oh, they're going to bite my neck problem. Yeah, so. yeah, and that definitely okay. came through. That definitely came through because it was, and it wasn't, I wouldn't even necessarily say it was, <clears throat> it came through as a race problem. That might not be the best way I would frame it. I would say it came through as more of a class problem. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, very much so. And seeing the individual beyond their class, mm -hmm. that's what I was getting at. Yeah. And that, yeah. that definitely shined through is like, you can have people who are, you know, just humans, which is the lower class, and have them be individuals of absolutely upstanding character and quality. And then you have some of the overseers who are scum. <laughs> well, like, you know, Neil Murray says, you know, human beings, they're all so beige. Can't tell the difference between one and the other. You know, about Neil Murray. He, he threw me for a loop, because when he was first introduced, I liked him. In the first couple introductions, I was... I did. In the first couple introductions, oh. before we really started to see much of his character, I liked him, because he was, he was like, these people aren't forward-thinking, they're holding humanity back, we could be crawling our way back out of the Stone Age right now, but Silas is preventing that, and I'm going to fix that. And I was like, that's actually a noble goal, He's a little bit of a cocky asshole, but that's a noble endeavor. Let's see where this goes. And then it went off the rails. <laughs> well, you know that everybody has their own viewpoint on what progress is. So. Uh, who? But Neil is my favorite character. Neil was He's your my favorite, favorite character, character to, to write with. Yeah, when he comes on stage, he just writes himself. Ah, uh, yeah, so I know He's that. in all the books. I know that feeling. I know that feeling 100%. There's some characters where I'm like, eh, I have to go back and I have to question if I got their dialogue right because this is this is this really in character for them? And then there's other characters where I'm like, nope, nope, this is just flowing right out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I imagined him as a tech guy from California where I just moved from, so. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the description of his 
ultra fancy abode and all of his neat little gadgets and i was like man this guy must have been like zuckerberg levels of silicon valley because yep. damn can you imagine mark zuckerberg going back going back to 1880 i can't he would just kill himself oh god i think I, I i honestly wouldn't be surprised if mark zuckerberg does kill himself one of these days because and i'm not saying that to be mean i'm saying that out of like a genuine level of human uh, concern and fascination with the man. Because if you look at him physically and his demeanor over the years, he's been getting more and more robotic. And there becomes a certain oh. point where you lose your soul and now you're an empty shell. And people that get like that usually tend to kill themselves. Oh, Zach, that is a great idea for a story. <laughs> Why the it's like Franz Kafka, where you you turn into a bug or you turn into a robot. I think that's a great idea. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna come up with an idea. Yeah, do you write? A, I do, do write. Do you yes. write? Do you write fiction? I do. I mean, I do write. I, my my genre that I'm writing right now is uh, science fiction, and I don't want to spoil too much because I'm I'm can keeping stuff under the lid right now. But there's there's a very real possibility that I've because of the way I've decided to do my story, I may have pigeonholed myself into that genre for a very long time. But that's okay, because I truly love the genre, and it's very versatile. Oh, it is. It's very robust, and you could go anywhere, almost. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, my, uh, I'm, this is your interview, so I'm not gonna, so I'm not gonna steal it or anything but just say it because you brought it up my first novel is in editing right now and i'm trying to get it to market asap so hopefully are you writing a, are you writing a series yeah well this one is part one of a trilogy yeah yeah oh man yep and i sometimes just... you get the world you know i started writing the londo chronicles which is the series that apothecary belongs in mm -hmm. and i was writing this other par paranormal series and it was really dark and I was with my critique group and everybody was saying, oh man, I just can't think of anything to write. And so we decided that we're going to write something completely different. Novellas, 25,000 words, piece of cake, no commitment. And I invented this world and I, I can't get myself out of it. I really love it. Yeah. It's fun. So, so uh, Apothecary started off as a novella? Yeah, um, the novella is called The Marriage Machine because the people that live in Londo City have to go through a, a kind of a... Yeah, yeah, you mentioned it quite a bit in Apothecary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so, so I actually have some questions about that. So I it, I saw that uh -oh. novella on your site, and I have some questions about The Marriage Machine because th there's a lot of questions left to the imagination if you only read Apothecary, which I it's the only thing from you I've read so far. So I... Yeah. So it's a lot lighter. It's kind of the marriage machine was more steampunkish, but then as usual, I just went dark. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. I know, I know how that goes. There's in my own writing, I have this thing where it's like, I like to, uh, I like to put you in this vast, beautiful setting, and everything's, everything's daisies and butterflies, and then like that it what happened why is everything so horrendously horrid and evil <laughs> yeah i love yeah. doing that that happens a lot you <laughs> get what you want yeah. so, so um my first my first actual written down scripted question that i wanted to ask because this struck me as there's there's a few reasons you might have done this and there's a few reasons that it does and doesn't make sense and so i wanted to hear what you had to say about it um oh, hopefully i have an answer <laughs> well the, so the book is called apothecary and um that's an old-timey word for people who made medicine and joanna is, is obviously that she's a very primitive herbalist and, and apothecary and Early on in the book, we find out that what she's doing is illegal, and I wanted to get why you decided to make it illegal, because there's, there's a few reasons, like I said, where I could see it would be illegal, and a few reasons it wouldn't be, um, and I want to hear what the overseer's thing is. I have a, yeah, 
I think I have an answer. Okay. It's two pronged. One, in the history of women uh, healthcare professionals, they were always put down and killed and suppressed by uh, the man. Mm -hmm. And um, they were doing good work for free, you know. A lot of the the time, yeah. Yeah, they wanted to make you pay. And uh, the second one is, um, I think the vampires would want to know what human beings are imbibing because it makes them taste different. That makes sense. That, that, that's, but it's mostly, yeah. I didn't even think about that one. I didn't even think about controlling what our food tastes like. I That one had not occurred to me. Well, maybe I should actually uh, mention that somewhere because that's a valid a valid question. Yeah, and, and uh, it's funny too because that should have popped into my head because a few places you do mention, like there's a bit of character dialogue and they say something about what have you been eating, you taste bad, or, or you know, you, you mention different things, doing different things to the blood. So that, that uh, yeah, that should have popped into my head, but it didn't. <laughs> and, and at the time when that came up, you didn't know Gabriel was a vampire and he didn't say anything like, you know, he couldn't say anything, so. Yeah, that's very true. My, my thinking was, I was like, they probably, I, I was thinking they kept it illegal as a means of keeping the populace just sick and weak enough to be easily controlled, because that's also a classic dictatorship, authoritarian government method, is you keep them just hungry enough, just sick enough to where they can't fight back. And obviously that, if you make medicine yeah. scarce, that goes a long way towards doing that. That is correct, too. Like, just feed him rice, you know? Rice, yep. Rice, a, a little bit of protein every now and then, which you make very clear is also scarce. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Yep, so... I will insert these things in my next one. If I write another one, I'm, I, it's it's percolating. I, I would regret... Uh, yeah, I'm... I have so much on my docket right now that I have that I... I have to read this before I can do other things. But once I'm back to a point where I have free time to read, I probably will come back and read more of the Londo Chronicles because I really want to see more of the world. And oh. yeah, I, I'm curious what happens too. I have to confess that um, right after I sent you my book for you to read, I was I saw something from you because I follow your blog now or something, and you started the series about what writers shouldn't do, <laughs> and and um, it was about know your audience and stuff. And I'm going, oh no, did he start this because of my book? Oh God, no, <laughs> absolutely okay. not, absolutely not. So I actually the the one about knowing your audience, I actually I I did start because of a book I read, um, um, but that was not related to you. And it was, and and it it was the main point there, as you may recall, is that um, the writing style was juxtaposed to the story, and it did not mesh well at all. Um, where it whereas yours is completely the opposite. Your story and your writing style blend very well. You're clearly writing to an adult audience, and your story and your story is very adult. It has adult themes. It it has a message, several messages up lying underneath to be picked up on and uh no that's absolutely not a problem in your writing <laughs> relief <laughs> you know writers are just so full of confidence you know uh, i think i think it's i i'm not sure if i would uh lump all writers into that one because i'm i'm fairly confident about my writing and and just myself as in general um but my my old man did a lot to instill me with confidence as a kid so now i come well, off as a little bit cocky to some people <laughs> you're lucky you're lucky uh it's 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 got it's it's got its pros and cons just like everything else like i said some people call me cocky and that's not fun <sighs> but uh moving on to get back on track <laughs> <laughs> so um like i said i did want to ask this is my next scripted thing and I did want to ask about the marriage machine because I thought that it there's just enough in Apothecary to, to like really get you questioning 
and so I wanted to ask about several things about it. Um, first of all, what is it and what does it do? And and then there's also the question of Joanna, the may I'd say she's the main protagonist of Apothecary. She um, is not having a menstrual cycle through her entire adult life, and she says that's because she hasn't been through the machine. But then we've, but then no, excuse me. Eve is the one who says you have to go through the machine to have your cycle start. But Joanna says when she mentions it early on in the book that she doesn't have one, that other women do. And so do you actually have to go through the machine to have it start? Does the machine actually do anything? Is it a bunch of hocus pocus to control the populace? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's hocus pocus. Got and, it. And um, people believe in it so much that it works. But the only people that can actually have intercourse are the ones that get selected to go in there. The other ones, you know, if they have intercourse, they, they're really risking their lives. Yeah. Which is made very clear. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it got it. And so, but, but it, it's actually, people have actually been so, uh, convinced that it works that it actually suppresses their biological functions what actually in my mind what actually suppressed the biological functions was nature itself um because of all the hardship these human beings have ha undergone since that um nuclear disaster and so they're coming back alive because everything's starting to improve they're getting more sunlight they're getting more food and they are coming back to normal but they don't know why yet you know got it that that does make sense and i i you know, i could have bought either one of those explanations because if you study what the human body is capable of and some of the things it does under extreme stress you find out that the mind is actually incredibly capable of doing all kinds of crazy stuff you can literally yeah. die of a broken heart emotional trauma can literally cause your heart to rupture and so <laughs> Wow, I've never heard that one, but I could believe it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's very similar to a heart attack. There's a tendon. If if you're like me and you've ever had your heart broken, you'll feel it. <laughs> There's a oh, tendon. I've never, I've never had my heart broken, ever. <laughs> <sighs> okay. But Sorry. particularly, uh, okay, I sh and I should clarify, not everyone responds to emotional trauma differently, so it's not everyone. But um, there's some tendons that attach to your heart down here and that's specifically where I feel it when I'm really upset is um, there's a tendon that attaches to your heart and it's one of the ones that kind of anchors your heart in place and allows it to pump properly and so it's constricting right yeah right and so if there's if you're if you're put under enough emotional trauma that tendon can snap and it's basically a heart attack and you're dead in minutes Wow it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> so. I'm just, thinking, I'm just thinking of this thing I'm writing right now. This is NaNoWriMo. Have you ever, do you do that? The writing I don't do it, the, but I, I've actually read a novel that was a result of it. That's how, um, that's what I, how I started the Londo Chronicles. And um, I got a real jump start on Apothecary. And this year, I'm trying something completely different because I told my daughter, I am not going to write anything dark during COVID. I just can't stand it. Nobody wants to go dark. I'm going to write a rom-com. I don't think I can. But um, I'm writing a dramedy, a screenplay. And um, it's just really fun. And it's about broken hearts. And, you know, it's not sci-fi or paranormal at all. So I'm, I'm really liking the change. Going to Richard Curtis. I can't say I've read anything from him. Oh, he's he's the mastermind of like all the movies like The Holiday, Love Actually, um, Bridget Jones, those kinds of no, you know. Got it. Got fun it. fluff stuff. I love it. Yeah. I you know I love a good love story too, but most of the time there has to be something going on besides the love story. Like I love a good love story against a, a greater backdrop because 
love is a huge part of life, but it's not all there is. And so most of the time I need something else going on. You have to have something else going on. Exactly. Or you're, you're, you're dead. And so is your love affair, you know, that's, yeah. That's yeah. what my heroine is learning. Love is not an issue to write about. Nope. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. All right. So my next, this one, and this one is also, uh, this is a more in-depth question about the world and kind of the mechanics of your world too. Um, so you have, you established that the vampires have a vampire virus. But when I when I read some of the stuff they can do, they feel kind of magical to me. And yep. then we have Joanna get a hefty dose of vampire blood, and she doesn't fully turn into a vampire. And so I'm wondering what your explanation is for that. And we, I'm, I want to hear what you have to say about that. About the virus? Yeah. I imagine, to me, vampirism is not paranormal. I think vampirism could occur from some weird biological thing that switches on in a human. And so I'm thinking vampires might catch some kind of weird virus because of this radiation cloud that starts changing their bodies and making them like start to actually rot. Yeah. You... Slowly, very slowly, because they're, you know, they're vampires. So, okay, so the vampire virus isn't isn't what turns them. It's something that developed and is now killing the vampires from the radiation? Yes, yeah. Okay, see, I, I'm not sure if I didn't read it properly or if it didn't come through that way because when I read it, I don't, I don't, I don't have time to reread the novel. So when I read it the first time, it, it came to me that the virus is actually what turns you into a vampire. Oh, oh well, Gabriel's blood did that to her, yes. But the vampires have this virus um, independent of that. Okay. And I, I actually haven't, they don't know what's causing that virus yet. Okay. That's what you don't know either, because they don't. It's a big mystery to Gabriel. He's the big doctor. He should find out. No, but he doesn't know. God, now, now yeah, now I'm going to have to read the rest of them, because I'm really curious what happens with that. <laughs> I don't know if I ever answered that question. Oh, you should get around. Oh, God, you should get around to it because that's, okay. I'll tell you this, um, I, that is one of the things that immediately I was like, oh, that's interesting because usually when you have vampires of any sort, they don't get sick. They're indomitable forces of nature. Trustable, yeah. And so when I read that we suddenly had vampires getting sick, I was like, oh, now this is original. I, I think I've seen the concept of a vampire sickness in one other piece of media and that was the movie daybreakers did you ever see that no no oh, daybreakers is an amazing great. piece of cinema okay i'm gonna watch that yeah it's great cinema it's ooh, i love that movie great acting very good premise uh dystopian much like your own work absolutely great piece of cinema okay thank you it's on my notes yeah, but uh, that and that, like I said, that was the only other place I ever recall seeing the concept of vampires getting sick, and it was from something. It was from something not. It was not a virus. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but <laughs> it was not a virus. All something right. They ate, perhaps. What was that? Something they ate, perhaps. You're sharp. I'm, I'm still not going to spoil it, but you're warm. <laughs> okay. 98.6. Okay. All right. So uh, next question um, is about your, your writing itself, not the story. But I wanted to talk about this because it's something that uh, analyzing writing is obviously something I like to do on my channel because I think that's one of the more um, wonkish and eggheadish things of literature appreciation that I don't see a whole lot of content for and so I like to do it but um, to get to the question you write in multi POV close third multi POV and you do it well I've read oh. other books that did a poor job at it you do a very good job at it it Thank felt you. exceedingly natural and blended into the narrative 
perfectly. And uh, I just want to know um, why do you why did you choose to write the story in multi POV? And do you don't do you only do it in the Londo Chronicles, or is that kind of typical in all your writing? It was a first for me, actually. Um, usually, I write in hero heroine POV. That's all. And I was thinking, how can I make my books more more better? And uh, <laughs> you know, Agatha Christie had this technique where she would write. She would introduce like six to eight characters like i did in the londo in the apothecary mm -hmm. because the human brain gets fascinated they want to solve the puzzle of how all of these beings are interconnected mm -hmm. and it, it they will keep reading until they find that out and that's the way agatha christie would draw people into her books and so that's what i tried in this one and i enjoyed it so much yeah I, you know and like i said you did it really well um, the only POV that I think was out of place and didn't really lend much to the greater narrative was Angela Beach. Um, oh. Yeah. She, I mean, she she gave... She served one little purpose, and that was to give us a little bit of a greater look into Gabriel Stone's character. It gave us a little bit more depth for his character, which did improve the story. And so she wasn't totally useless, but if she was cut out, it also wouldn't have destroyed the novel. You know what I mean? Yeah, she does appear in in the other novels, though, if that makes any difference to you. Oh, it definitely does. It definitely does. I, and she, we didn't find out if anything happened to her at the end of this one. And, li and like I said, she's not, like, it's not horrible to read her parts. And like I said, she lends character development, so she serves a purpose. And so I was not like, oh, God, here's another beach POV. Like, I was like, okay, oh, where are we going this time? It, it was, yeah, like I said, the multi POVs was done very well, and I enjoyed all of it. Oh, good. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, next, and then this one is also about the, the way you structure your narrative. So um, you use a little bit of nonlinear storytelling, and that's another one of those things that a lot of people try to do and is rarely done well in my opinion um, but you managed you pulled it off you have a few times where you jump back in time or you show two things that are happening simultaneously and it's done well and a lot of people struggle with that and the main the main struggle i've noticed when people have jump backs is they struggle to make the jump back relevant like, why did you jump back? We, this isn't adding anything. But with you, you, the primary one that sticks out in my head is you used it to introduce a bunch of cast members. And so it was highly relevant and, and it, it, uh, I was wondering why you did it early, but then as I kept reading, I was like, oh, she did it to introduce this cast, this part of the cast. And it, it blended right in as the story went on. And so, um, is that something uh, my 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 question was is that something that you only did in this novel again or is that something you do regularly and how did you get good at that technique um i don't do it very often because i like a story i don't like jumping around too much in a story because i get lost sometimes um and so and my stories are usually very tight around a certain period of time i write kind of gothics where you know the heroine is stuck in a house and scared for two weeks and then falls in love or something, you know. But for this one, I had to jump back a little bit, like with her parents. That just a couple things, but generally I tend not to do that. And I, I hope that it was okay, that it was successful. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, the main one that sticks out was actually very early on in the book. It was one of the first notes I made because uh, you jumped back from the train wreck to earlier in that day to introduce the overseers. Yeah, because then the train wreck was the most exciting thing to my mind, <laughs> you know, to open with the train wreck, so. Uh, you know, the train wreck was pretty, the train wreck was pretty exciting, but to me, the riot was equally as exciting. And I was also very engaged with 
the, your your the the tension in your politics and the the tension in the social hierarchy um well done politics can be almost as fun to read as an action scene for me because it's it it's a it's a battle of the minds and i love that i love that kind of stuff and so that was also very fun to read in my opinion oh good to me you know it gets old you know i want a little bit of human interaction but um yeah i tried really hard <laughs> it shows okay good thing Okay, now and now this one, this one is one that I the entire time I was reading this was bugging me. This is one of the ones I was like, oh god, really? It's about Gabriel. So, okay, one thing I have trouble buying is that Gabriel and his brother have been alive for the better part of a millennium, and just now, in the course of a couple days. Gabriel is realizing what a turd his brother is. And I just want to get your thoughts oh. on that. <laughs> doesn't it, doesn't it, don't you come to a point in your life when you just turn a corner? Or he would, you think he was like, he was okay with his brother at first? Should he have just, should he have been more disgusted? He's very loyal. Yeah, that he is loyal he's, to a fault. Yeah. Yeah, he's a loyal guy. Kind of self he's just self focused. Uh hmm. That's a good point though. That's a good point. Yeah, that because you do. To to me, yeah. that was his that was Gabriel's if I had to pick a character flaw for every character in the book, that would have been his. It's like He's supposed to be really sm he's obviously really smart. There's no question. He's a, he's a medical doctor and he's discerning um an analytical be much beyond what most people are. And so yeah, I guess I but he's also loyal to a fault. And so I guess I can I I'm willing to just accept that he just let his loyalty blind him on that one, but man, that is some cognitive dissonance to the extreme. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey. It's it's like how this election brings out your family, you know, dissonance. So. Uh, yeah, uh, I I don't like getting into politics uh, on because yeah, it, it can go really far in one direction or the other. But yeah, cognitive. So the yeah, in in, okay. in regards to cognitive dissonance. The, that one real world example does absolutely bring to light how uh, how Gabriel actually is completely re his that that little bit of cognitive dissonance is completely reasonable because there's much more insane instances in real life. <laughs> yeah, and he's pretty mad about his old girlfriend too. I he didn't completely love everything about his brother. But yeah, what do you do? You're a vampire. Your brother is your companion forever. You can't just like, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, well, you know, I think if I was Gabriel, so I understand the loyalty to a fault thing because I have a bit of that characteristic myself. I, to this day, remain loyalty loyal to people who have quite literally pushed me out of their life and said, don't come back. And I'm still, as far as I'm concerned, on their side if they ever needed me. So I understand the being loyal to a fault thing. But uh, I think if I was in Gabriel's position and I had this several centuries of my brother being a dick to me <laughs> under my belt, I would have definitely reached a point where I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going somewhere where you aren't. Bye. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what I would have done. I would have just struck out and... Uh, you you especially mentioned like the savage wildernesses. If I was Gabriel, that's probably what I would have done. I would have struck out someplace into the savage wild and uh, tried to civilize a different corner of the world. That's but he couldn't do that. His people were the the humans need him in Londo. You can't leave your patients and the people. Well, what about the other humans of the rest of the world? Don't they, they need him too? 
Well, there's hardly any of them around, so I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> you had a lot of reasons to stay, but like you said, you should have thought about leaving a lot more. You know, he could have done that at least. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. that was that was my whole thing is because the it was just such an abrupt it was just such an abrupt change of heart over Caroline or not not over Caroline over Joanna. Like he meets this girl, and all of a sudden his perspective starts rapidly changing, and that just felt a little bit odd because he's this several. He, you know, almost a millennia old, and he meets a girl, and in the space of a week or a fortnight, yeah, in the space of fourteen days, yeah. he yeah. he decides, yeah, my brother is a piece of shit. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. that was my one. That was my one bitch Point about taken. him. <laughs> you got me. Hey, I call it like I see it. Not trying to pick on you. I'm just saying it felt out of place to me. <laughs> I can yeah. see that. I can see that now. So uh, one thing now. Now this one is completely in the opposite direction. This was heart wrenching, but in like a beautiful, in a, in a sad and beautiful way to me. Um, page two fourteen. Um, uh, this is a bit of dialogue followed by the uh, after dialogue descriptor. Am I looking at heaven? Her voice cracked. And that's when she's looking at the book of the apothecary garden that Gabriel Stone gives her. And I cried. I literally wept. I was like, that is so beautiful, but so tragic. I literally, I was like, oh God, that's sad. <laughs> I had to wipe away a few tears from my face. And, <laughs> cause it, cause I, and, and the reason is, you know, to, for someone to be living in a world that's, so bland of color and so horrendous for them to look at a picture that's just nothing more than a normal herb garden to you and me and to, for them to think that's heaven yeah it's it's simultaneously it's beautiful because it reminds us to appreciate the beauty that all of us have access to every day we can go to a park um, assuming it's not overrun with homeless people <laughs> and, and look at the beautiful plants and the sculptures that they often put in parks and the water displays and we take for granted how truly beautiful these things are and then we're we're reminded by that description and, and that one little bit of dialogue how bleak the world could be and we know it can we literally know it can be that bleak because um Auschwitz happened and yeah. so yeah. and so yeah. it's such a it was just such a hard-hitting moment and I want to know like when you wrote that did did you realize how hard-hitting that was um I was trying to actually portray that because I had been watching something on television about the war and it was when the, the the bombs were hitting London and people had to live in the tunnels every night and it was pea soup fog, pea soup fog. And I also lived in Seattle for 25 years. One time, one year rained for 52 days straight. And I know what it's like. You get up and every dang day, there is no sunlight. And I just started to think, what would it be like to never have seen the sun? Doesn't that kind of give you a weird chill? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I absolutely love the sun, and I love laying in the sun, and I love all the beautiful plants that the sun makes available to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. So, yes, that's what I meant by that. And, you know, we we got to watch what we're doing as a race. I do agree. It's a, a cautionary tale. I think... Uh, I think I agree with you that we have to watch what we're doing. Um, but I also think there's there's plenty of cause for hope. Um, I think that there's plenty of reason to suspect that we will reach a point where our technology allows us to solve these problems before they reach an irredeemable critical mass. Um, and the, the main reason I believe that is because all of the doom and gloom predictions have been wrong so far. Uh, Florida was supposed to be underwater right now, and it's not. <laughs> so... Yep. 
I yeah. get it. I get it. There's a problem, and we got to work towards solving it. But uh, it's clearly not as ultra mega urgent as some of you would like me to believe. <laughs> Yeah, but it makes for good fiction, you it know. It does the, make the, for good fiction. No argument there. Read or worry, yeah. You know. So, hey, my... did, did you know that in 2021, California, most of it's going to be there's going to be a big earthquake and it's going into the ocean. Oh, <laughs> that's, that... that's the next one. <laughs> that's what Nostradamus said. I was doing uh, some research and found that out about him. He predicted that. But he also predicted that Trump would win. So, Nostradamus is a fascinating character. He was actually in one of the novels I read uh, recently for my channel. And he was probably my favorite character in that novel. Um, I've always been fascinated. with. I, I really should at some point actually sit down and read his works. Because I've heard people talk about his works. But I've never had the, I guess, time or the incentive to sit down and actually just read all of his stuff. I should at some point. But all those predictions were in one one volume, I think. And I don't know how people decide they're about Hitler. <laughs> whoever whoever translates those is a genius or a fool. I don't know. Or a madman. <laughs> madman, yeah. But uh, he fascinates me, too. He, he yeah. lived in Turin, Italy, and that's a fascinating place as well. Yeah, and, I love... Uh... I love the old world, as it's often called, all of those um, Western and Central and Eastern European countries, um, and the history they have, and the folklore, and, oh, God, that's good. Apparently, apparently, Turin is this vortex of these two triangles that represent black magic and white magic, and right at the point is um on the white magic side is where the Shroud of Turin is, and then on the other side, there's a lot of creepy stuff. Like the gates to hell. Well, now I'm now I'm writing down a note to do research <laughs> later. That's a fun little bit of. Yeah, and just go look up Turin. Although you know all the stuff I'm reading says these facts have never been substantiated, and that kind of tells me that maybe somebody's hiding something. I I understand that thought process a hundred percent. Yeah, check it out. It's a cool city. I've never actually been there, but. I'm it's on go my notepad. <laughs> so, uh, back to your book. Um, now, my, my next question is, this, this one popped out to me because Eva, Joanna's sister, reminded me very heavily of someone who was once very dear. She's still very dear to me. I'm not going to lie to myself or the world. She's still very dear to me. But she, Eva and her, half the time I felt like you were writing about this person I knew. I mean, geez. And um, so it, it popped out to me to ask you, um, by page 323, Eva has completely flipped her tone about Aiden, the father of her child. And my, my question is, it, did she really, is she really just so fickle that her emotions can change at the drop of a hat like that? Or did she ever actually care about Aiden? She was so, um, she was so hot and cold and so immature that that's what she decided to do to save her own skin and not to make waves and try to make the best of her life. And then you should read the next book because it's all about Eva and you, and you know, maybe it's a prediction about your old, your old love. Maybe she's like this now in book two. She's, she comes into her maturity. She it's, it's a wonderful story. Oh God. Don't do that. Don't give me hope. <laughs> <laughs> it can happen. I mean, it can happen. Fine. People. I... Yeah. I firmly believe people can change. They just have to be given the incentive and the means to do it. And unfortunately, those two things don't coincide nearly as often as I wish they would because um, those two things yeah. are hard to come that's by. Why we, we, that's why we write fiction, because we want to give people hope. A lot of people will read a story of redemption, and it gives them the strength to try i think that is a huge theme in my own work <laughs> i 
I'm gonna have to. Oh. Good. I'm gonna have to send you a copy of my uh, my novel once I. Oh. It's, it's. Uh, I'll be a beta reader. Yeah. Love it. Well, actually, not the first one. The first one is already in the final editing stage. I'm going through and getting all the nitpicky grammar stuff corrected, and I'm having a cover artist is working on it right now too. Um, but I was thinking more as an arc. I could send you an arc of it. Hmm. I would love to. I'd love to read it, Zach. Yep. No, I. I'll add you to the list. I got a growing list of people I want to send one to. I'll add you to it because yeah, it's. Uh, I like I like discussing my own work almost as much as I like eating food. <laughs> like, I, I love talking about my writing. It drives me. <laughs> I like talking about plots, and I love to help people, you know, help them when they they hit a wall. I just love, you know, doing that. I can't do it for myself so much, but. <laughs> You know? Isn't that funny how 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 the human brain works like that? Like we we can analyze the hell out of someone else's work, and we can pick it apart and and pick all the little things that don't quite work or that could be made better, or you could make this tweak and optimize it. But then we look at our own and we're like, no, it's perfect as is. <laughs> you know what my hardest thing is is to write a book description, because the book is like this huge hot air balloon above my head and I can't I don't know I have to get it down to the size of, of a little balloon and I just can't and then somebody writes a review and I go how did you do that that so well you know three sentences boom you've got the story down that is an art form yeah it uh it took me a while to write my synopsis because I was pursuing traditional publishing before I decided to self-publish and uh I couldn't get picked up because my work, my novel is uh, 26,000 words over the traditional publishing standard yeah. for my like, for my age group and genre. And so I was getting auto-rejected by agents. And I said, well, fuck you. I'm not cutting out all this great material. So I'm just going to publish it my damn self. <laughs> Are you a YA, writing, writing YA? No, adult. Oh. I thought, you know, adults like anything over 100K. Well, the, the traditional standard for science fiction in adult is 90,000 through 120 and my my debut novel um is 146,000 words it's a beefy boy i have four words for you george r r martin <laughs> now look yeah. don't go and cite the king of drawing out the story to me <laughs> <laughs> That's a pinnacle that I will climb to another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh, I had to stop watching Game of Thrones because, you know, they killed too many people I had fallen in love with, and I just got too distraught. <laughs> so, and then somebody said, oh, more, more is coming, and I thought, oh, great, I can't do this anymore. You know, it's, you mentioned earlier, and so I'm going to, I'm going to draw back to it because, um, shameless self-promotion but it's also relevant in my uh in my in my own body of work i touch upon the the idea of a character driven novel versus story driven novel and that's the thing that uh, people don't understand about george rr R. martin's work it's a story driven story he's not trying to latch on to one character and make the story about that character his story is about this epic tale of events and these amazing things that are happening in this world and it just so happens that he's very good at writing characters and so you get attached to them because they're very good characters but the yeah. story was never about them and so they're on the chopping block <laughs> yep i'm a character driven author from way back in fact i think you know, you design characters to, to take your story where it's supposed to go, but it's about the character. I, I can agree and, and and disagree with that. There's um, there's certainly a story that I want to tell, but I also want I design my characters to function within that story to make it the best story it can be. This if I create a different character and throw them into the same story it changes the oh, no. story oh yeah and so yeah uh, it's it's a it's a precarious balance i want to tell this story 
but I absolutely want to make these characters an indisposable part of it. So I right. definitely see both sides of the spectrum. I kind of, I kind of ride the line on character driven versus story driven. <laughs> oh, both are, both are important. Yeah, but yeah. if if I portray a battle, the battle's about two sentences. Then I go back to my my main soldier. You know. I noticed. I you have that uh, very thing happen in the riot. <laughs> yeah, I I don't like to spend too much time on that kind of stuff. You know, the fighting. <sighs> uh, you might not, you might not care for certain sections of my own work that I violence is uh, and but there's also a reason violence is a big part of my story because um it's my main character is a warrior so, oh. so well he's got to do what he has to do exactly it's kind of a natural part of the novel man we went off on a huge tangent back to, <laughs> back to your work yeah, <laughs> so, I, love, I love talking to writers so it's so, fun i appreciate that so um and this last one this is kind of the only plot hole that I could pick out in your work. <laughs> well, you might have a perfectly reasonable explanation for it. I don't know. Let's see what you have to say. Um, but uh, it was announced that the marriage machine was being postponed. Uh, Joanna went to get her rations and they made the announcements that we're, we're postponing all marriage ceremonies. And it was shown that that decision had not been reversed. We, we never see a scene where they announce, okay, the marriage ceremonies are back on. And we can assume that when Joanna went back to tell Eva or to, to Eva after she got her rations that she would have said, hey, they postponed the marriages because that's the kind of person Joanna is. She would inform her sister about that kind of thing. But we don't see Eva finding out at any point that they'd reversed that decision that, that the marriages were going to continue. And so... That just felt like a plot hole to me, or maybe maybe that's being a little bit too critical and it's just something that happened behind the scenes that didn't have that didn't fall onto the page, but it did happen. So I wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, I thought I had a town crier going through the streets announcing something. I will have to go back and look. You did yeah, you did have a town crier going through. Um, he announced that the lockdown was over. The lockdown was over. Hmm, I'm going to have to go check, because I think you might have... I should... I should fill that hole. Sorry, because in the marriage... Part of the marriage machine is that the heroine is the mechanic that fix it, fixes it after this issue with um, Neil Murray and Aiden Bannister, what they did to it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like you said, nobody knows that it's actually been reenacted or, you know, revived. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at that. Beauty of uh, indie publishing is you can fix stuff like that pretty, pretty easily, pretty easily. Yeah. And and if I if it turns out that I'm uh, full of full of bullpucky and uh, it's actually explained in the text somewhere let me know because <laughs> okay. I, I want to go back and then look at it again myself to find out where I got that misconception because I'm always looking to improve my ability to analyze and understand properly yeah I'll go I'll have to look at that I thought that I, I had the town crier saying something but that I guess I didn't yeah, like I said, it, the way I remember it, he announced that uh, the lockdown was over, and you know, I like I said, I suppose in in regards to like stuff that you just assume it happened off page, um, I suppose that Eva could have heard that and then gone out and talked to someone and then found out that the marriages were back on, but uh, and that's that's a reasonable assumption, but yeah, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> Yeah, I will fix that. Uh, so, yeah. Good eye. You get, you get a point for that. Uh, you know, thank you. And and my my whole thing is I like digging, like you said, I like digging into stories, and I like uh, I like analyzing stories and writing, and it's very fun to 
think about why things happened and how they happened. And yeah, that was one of those things that just stuck out to me. Like, how did Eva, why did Eva show up for her marriage when, as far as she knew, they were canceled? Yeah. <laughs> that one was bugging me for a little bit. Yeah, because Joanna never actually said the marriages were off, did she? Not that I... Nope. I don't that think... Is a real... Yeah. Yeah, I don't so... think it happened on page, but it was, like I said, it was... it was. Joanna's character was so thoroughly established as being ultra-prudent and ultra-practical and, you know, being on top of practical matters that I was like, yeah. surely Joanna just told her sister at some point. And so mm -hmm. that one made sense to me, but I, but then because of the way the timeline boiled down, I don't know if Joanna would have had a chance to, or even would have found out that the marriages were put back on because of all the stuff that was going on. And so I was like, how did hmm. you find that out? <laughs> she got an email. <laughs> yeah. let, let, let me just check. Let me just check dystopianhellhole.com to see if I've been updated. <laughs> yeah, dystopian hellhole. Oh, yeah. God, Londo City. It, oh, yeah, and you know, that was that, that reminds me. That was another thing I wanted to ask about. Um, you, it's very clear that your story is set on an Earth-like planet. Um, is Is it supposed to be like this earth or is it, or is it some alternate earth no it's this earth okay in the future and you know how signs get wrecked and things that say london lose their ends and people forget and that's what happened gotcha gotcha i just couldn't for some reason i wanted to call it londo city it just sounded like the future to me yeah that things certainly have a natural tendency to evolve and weird and unexpected ways so that felt natural to me that it would be shortened to londo and the other thing too is uh in the writing you actually had this fun little bit uh, you had this fun passage talking about how it used to be called london and before that it was even called how do you say that Lon londinium londinium yeah is that is that factual yeah the romans that was the roman name oh yeah. that is that is fascinating. That's a beautiful little bit of history. But yeah, uh, as the reason I thought that was so interesting is because it really illustrated the point that language and the way we define things evolves over time and it has a tendency to shift with the culture. And so in the, here you had the Romans who were a very um, cerebral and philosophical culture and we have this grand name londinium yeah yeah mm -hmm. and then we have a more a more practical time where practical matters are the the farmers the yeah, farmers the main picture. concern of the people and then and during that time frame is called london which still sounds somewhat regal but it's also not a mouthful and then you and then we jump forward into the future where humanity can barely read and we have londo <laughs> so <laughs> yeah that's true so yeah. yeah it gets simpler and simpler as humanity degrades and that uh, yeah that was a beautiful little parallel that fits seamlessly in oh good good and then there was so there was something else i want i actually have a link i'm going to share with you and it's to it's to a YouTube video where that has six hours of music. And I was reading, or not reading, I was listening to this as I was reading your work because thematically I felt like it was just like perfect. Wow, oh, I love, I love movie uh, soundtracks to listen to when I'm writing. Yep. Like Hans Zimmer is my hero. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and where's it? Where is it gonna, there it is. I'm dropping it in the chat right now, and I highly oh, recommend okay. you go check that out. And because, oh, okay. like I said, I I I'm not the fastest reader, and so it took me 
maybe uh, 18 to 24 hours of total reading time to make it through, and that's six hours of music, and I pretty much just listen to that on repeat, because it thematically, it just fits your book so well, especially huh? the sections. Um, it's, a, it's a various artist, and especially the sections from an artist by the name of um, Atrium uh, Carceri. It's like, oh my god, I'm so immersed because this background music fits this book perfectly. Oh my gosh. It, I gotta go listen to that. Yeah, oh darn it. That's not what I meant to do there. So if I click that, Zach, will that take me to music that will override this video? Or should I just wait? Um, no. it. I don't know if it would override it. I'm pretty sure it would just show up as background audio in the video. But if you want to play it really quick, go for it. <laughs> I don't think I should for copyright reasons. I'll just, uh, I'll copy it and throw it in my notes. There you go. That's good thinking. See, I, I don't think about stuff like that nearly as much as I should. I got to get on, I got to learn to get in that mindset a little bit more. Once but, you get your content out there, you don't want people using it, you know, for well, free. Well, actually, I actually have, uh, my channel set up to where people can take snippets of my videos and I, I thought about that very seriously when I first started putting up content because if people use my content for free it's not really for free because they're putting my face out there on their on their time and energy so it's free marketing <laughs> I was talking more about your sci-fi novel oh yes that's a good point that one yeah. I oh yeah those I'm, literary pirates are just everywhere it's just sad and yeah people don't realize that it's bad but they're just robbing writers. yeah i i will confess that uh i've actually dabbled in the consumption of pirated work but in my defense it was a book that i'd purchased at the store it was jim butch it was one of the things from uh jim butcher's oh. dresden files and i have the entire physical collection i love his work and i literally own every book from that collection in fact well, that isn't piracy then. It, yeah, exactly. It wasn't quite that... piracy. It was just uh, looking at something that was pirated. But <laughs> but yeah, I even have one of his uh, lesser known things, which is the uh, graphic novel of a short story. And yeah, I love Jim Butcher's stuff. But anyways, so knowing that that stuff existed, I was a little bit paranoid. And so before I even sent my novel out to like, submission for publishers or anything like that i copyrighted it oh good <laughs> yeah good i copyright yeah. and i i kind of feel silly because i copyrighted the rough draft and so the part the version that's copyright still has all the grammatical errors and all that. You, can, you can prove it was your idea though with that so that's valid yeah so it's, I just think I just kind of think it's funny the idea the Library of Congress has this beta version that it's so full of errors. That's the thing they'll dredge up, you know, in twenty twenty five or twenty five twenty five, Zach's greatest work, and they'll go what? <laughs> It'll be in the Library of Congress. <laughs> Whoa, God! Wouldn't that be depressing if my debut novel? And it went down from my career as my greatest work. That would be something else. <laughs> you know, sometimes that happens and it's kind of a sad thing. You know? Yeah, I, I sure hope that doesn't happen with mine. I, I don't think it will. My writing has... The, the really interesting thing about my writing is that it evolved over the course of even writing my first novel. And so there's a very clear difference between when I started the novel and when I ended it. And I actually thought about going back and rewriting the parts that I'd done earlier to make my style more fluid. But then it occurred to me that it actually, because of the way the narrative is structured and what happens, it actually makes sense within the book to leave it like that for multiple reasons. It just evolves. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Huh. Can I ask you why you continue to write? Why I continue to write? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> there's a few reasons. Um, the main reason, uh, it's very personal, but I'm also not shy about it, so I'm just going to say it as um, succinctly and intelligently as I can. 
Uh, I was in a very dark place. I just lost the love of my life because she decided that we weren't working. And I needed something to keep me from blowing my brains out. And I decided that if I couldn't get the noise out of my head, then I could... Uh, you know, if I couldn't just silence it through willpower alone, that I could try to get it out by writing it down. And I could focus my energy and all this pain I was feeling into something constructive. And so I sat down and wrote a 148, 146,000 word novel. <laughs> and it's was almost... it about that heartache or was it about just something else to divert you? So it both. It's both. So it's a fictional world and it's a it's actually a story that me and my best friend... Uh, Wesley Maynard, who uh, recently passed, uh, sat down. We came up with this in high school, and we we hammered out all the details of the world, the the government, and the races, and the setting, and we we put some of our original characters in, and we had a very uh, we had the we had the skeleton, we had the skeleton of a good story, and then. Years later, I have this horrendous heartbreak, and I sat down and started putting meat on the bones. And it turned into the novel that's currently getting edited. Okay. Okay, so what was your second reason? So the second reason is, like I said, I sat down and started writing this to prevent myself from blowing my brains out. And... Uh... There's a suicide epidemic among my demographic. Young men are killing themselves in droves. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and I don't want to get into it because it starts dipping into politics really quick. And that again, that's just something I don't like dipping into on my channel because uh, obvious reasons. But yeah. the, the cause of the problem isn't so much an issue as is finding a way to solve it. It's like, it's, it exists... Let's find a way to solve it. And one of the ways you prevent people from killing themselves is by making them feel like there's hope and making them feel like they aren't alone. Those are two of the fastest ways to get someone to re-engage with life. And that's what I want my writing to do. I want young men and women who feel the way I feel and who have been through the levels of suffering that I've been through in my own head uh, because pr in practical matters, my life has been fairly blessed. I, I'm in a, a lower middle class family. I've never slept on the street. Only missed one or two meals in my life because it wasn't food. So it, compared to, you know, 90% of the world's population, in practical matters, I'm doing really good. Yeah. But, but uh, mental illness often has a lot less to do with practical matters than it does things that are in your own head. And so I sat down and I says to myself, I want to be there through my writing for people who have suffered like I've suffered. And that is the secondary goal of my writing is I want to make people feel like someone else understands and like they're not alone. That's interesting. Um, I think that is a beautiful reason and I, I'm in a Facebook group for fantasy readers just because I want to know what they're talking about and reading. And this one guy, young man, said, I used to be in this really, really dark place, you know, um, drugs, alcohol, everything. And the thing that saved me was a sci-fi fantasy book. And it just took me away. And I am a voracious reader now. And it's changed my life. This is beautiful. Yeah, uh, that gives me hope that I'm not running a fool's errand. <laughs> yeah. The reason, I'm, the reason I'm asking you this is the screenplay I'm writing is about a woman who is questioning why she does write, and all through my life I've thought that if writers had happy lives we wouldn't be writing. <laughs> and it is kind of that we're mentally ill in some way or trying to solve a mental issue that's not debilitating to us most of the time but it just we can't let it go we keep chewing at it 
we keep chomping at the bit you know you're touching on something that it's a it's a subject and a quirk of humanity that fascinates me i saw it when i was a young man in high school i saw a documentary i i've been looking for it and looking for it because i want to rewatch it um but i can't find it so <laughs> maybe someone will watch this and drop it in the comments i would I, i'd love that but i remember the title being touched by fire and it was a documentary about artists and mental illness and mm -hmm. how mental illness affects art and it went through and it they analyzed tons of historical records and they made a very strong case for the argument that literally every artist who's been largely influential on any culture was batshit insane <laughs> to, yeah. those are my words I, not the documentaries I, but that they made a very compelling case for it i mean Edgar Allan Poe, Lovecraft, even Shakespeare. I'm pretty sure Shakespeare had an Oedipus complex. Like, yeah, they were like, all just not, they did not, they were individuals. That's what I like to call them. And that's they a good way of to, saying it. Yeah. Yep. Artists so are supremely individualistic and unique. In, and one of the things that allows that is the brand of mental illness because every brand of mental illness is its own brand no two are no two are identical i don't want to even call it illness i just want to say we're different and my daughter keeps saying mom you've got to change you're just like blah you're just like you always want to be alone and i'm thinking damn it i don't want to because this is who i am and i'm an artist and this is i'm i'm embracing it so yeah. you know the I, I understand that perspective and I identify with it to a large degree. For a very large portion of my childhood, um, I was told by my peers that I was weird and chain than freaky and because I walked around barefoot and I acted like and more like an adult than a kid because my I didn't go to public school and so I spent a lot of time around my dad's friends and doing errands with my parents and not associating with people my age. So I quickly picked up a higher vocabulary. I picked up older mannerisms. I acted more like an adult than a kid. And so when I did interact with kids, they didn't like me. <laughs> so, And so uh, I, I was compelled by my peers early on to change. And I was like, why should I change to be more like you? You suck. <laughs> Yeah, you don't even read books, you know? <laughs> well, yeah. I didn't either until I was about nine. I, I literally couldn't read until I was nine. That's a fun little fact about me. Wow. I wrote my first book when I was 12. No kidding. The day he opened the coffin. I still have it. That's kind of an, that's a, that's an interesting this is title. Intriguing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's that's a fun little bit of a that's a fun little bit of trivia about me is I couldn't read until I was nine and then I wrote it out when I was 27. <laughs> and wow. yeah, and, uh, but any, I, I went off on a, I went on off on a tangent back to the documentary and the, the mental illness thing. Um, so yeah, this documentary covered people that were mentally ill and their art and it made the connection there. And that is a huge theme in my own writing and it's a huge theme that I, and it's something I love reading about and a theme I like exploring. If you look at not just art either, but philosophy, <clears throat> if you look at um, the route philosophy has taken throughout Western and Eastern culture, you can see this pretty, in my opinion, there's a very strong case for philosophies that are linked to practical matters and philosophies that are designed to reinforce a practical and pragmatic viewpoint of the world those philosophies trend up and they they attach to the, the culture and the civilization and the civilization and the culture trends up and makes improvements and philosophies that are overly cerebral and overly indulgent in thought and artificial structures and artificial ideas those philosophies drag culture and society down and mm. And I think that's a very interesting parallel that exists. And the reason for that is, is because <clears throat> I can't remember the philosopher's name, but there's a, he has a, a very famous bit of his speech called overthinker, overthinking. I'm actually going to Google it right now. Uh, da, da, da. 
it's a uh, <coughs> it's a over thing. I'm trying to remember the philosopher who because I really want to get I really want to get his name on this record so that. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I am so bad at remembering where I found things and like oh no kidding <laughs> and and where I need to go to retrieve them. Hang on, I have a I have a playlist for philosophy, and I'm pretty sure I saved it in there. Alan Watts. Oh, Alan, Alan Watts. Watts. I've actually heard of him. Yeah, yeah. So he has. Alan Watts has a section of philosophy, a lecture called Overthinking. And he talks in depth about how thinking is a great servant but a bad master. And when you overthink things and all you do is continue to build and build and build upon the structures in your own mind, it inevitably leads to ruin because none of that is real as much as it might as much as it might relate or as much as you might think it relates to the real world the fact is your thoughts are not manifest they're not they're not tangible you can't hold them and so <laughs> overthinking can be uh, the death knell of a society and a culture that's an interesting um, concept because I keep coming back to what I'm writing right now and that's what the person I'm taking this course through just it's a book how to write a screenplay in 21 days at this one point I think it was day eight she goes okay you got to do this in your your novel your 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 protagonist has to solve her problem go do something don't think about it and your brain will come up with a solution she said do not think about anything go do something like clean out the barn or whatnot it's just it's always amazing to me our brains are our enemies most of the time i'm not sure if i would it's say not our brains but our thoughts are, are yes it's because our thoughts are the master of our brain we just need to like let the brain do its thing get out of the way yeah and it's all about childhood trauma and whatnot yeah, yeah. uh filter i i partially i agree and disagree i would frame it a little bit differently um, we can, you can think of the brain like a computer and you can think of active thoughts as programs you're running on it and things you're trying to get the computer to do. And if you are able to silence your mind by doing some menial task that is fairly automatic, but it requires just enough attention to where you have to pay attention to what you're doing, then you shut down a lot of your active thoughts and the computer can defrag and it can free up space and actually start processing through stuff that it needs to process through, or which bandwidth. is yeah. yeah, free up a bunch of yeah bandwidth and uh, or, or yeah. RAM to actually just to use the proper computing term. Um, yeah. And so what you're talking about is something that actually gets I don't know if you've ever been to therapy. I have <laughs> a couple times. <laughs> couple times. And so one thing as a kid, one of the first techniques my therapist introduced to me um, was do something mindless to take your mind off what's bugging you and you'll process what's bugging you in the background and you'll feel better by usually by the end of the mindless thing. And so I learned beating as a kid. <laughs> you learned what? Beating, macrame. Oh, I thought you said beating. Oh. <laughs> Okay. No. Yeah. Why would you ever say, who have you been talking to? <laughs> I'm just making assumptions. So, uh, yeah, I always go out and weed. So. Yeah, I don't like, I don't like weeding. <laughs> I, it's funny, I like growing things. Uh, I, I, my family had a garden in our backyard for the vast majority of my life, and I like growing things and harvesting what we grow. But weeding was always the part I hated. <laughs> it's gotta be done. It, it's, it's, yeah. I th and I think it's because, I think I hated it because it's one of those things. It's, it's, it's drudgery, and it's repetitive, and it's one of those things that uh, has no 
instant reward, you know what I mean? I mean, neither does planting the seeds, but I like that because I just kind of got to put stuff in the dirt, and there was something satisfying about chucking stuff in the dirt. And you know that it's going to grow into something that you can eat, but a weed, we don't eat weeds, we should be, but we're not, but, you know, we're just, our culture's just really messed up. There's only a few weeds you can eat, at least where I live. You can eat dandelions. Um, I Burdock. Know, what was that? Burdock. You can eat that. You can eat a lot of stuff. I never, yeah. I, un, I'm unsure. I'm going to write that down and look up Murdoch. Murdoch. It's a medicinal plant. You can also eat the stuff that clings to you. Uh, something willy, sticky willy. <laughs> that <just> sounds bad. <laughs> it does sound, <laughs> that sounds like an innuendo. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, oh man, you, you're, you're as bad as AF Stewart, or not, 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 not AF Stewart, um, Nikki, you're as bad as Nikki Hicks. We get off on these tangents and we just go oh. off <laughs> rabbit yeah, holes. I, can, I don't get out much during COVID. I think that's why. Oh, God. It is. I'm I'm currently furloughed from my job because of it. King Inslee has decreed that I'm unworthy of working. Oh, man. Yeah, my daughter is living with us because she's in the same boat. So. Yeah. <sighs> not a fan of what's going on in the world right now let me tell you <laughs> i'll keep writing that'll keep you going oh believe me i have no intention of stopping i at least have to finish book three like i said book one is getting edited book two the rough draft i just finished the rough draft i actually made a post about it on my twitter when i finished the rough draft so that just got done a couple days ago and now that's sitting off to the side so that it can defrag in the back of my mind and i can decide oh, what i want to change festering yeah that yeah that's a good word for it because i there's a few things it's not nearly as long as the first one and i want to add in a little bit of content to bring the length up a little bit because i don't want it to be so much terribly shorter than the first one. Oh yeah yeah, and so I, uh, I'm pro what I'm probably going to do is just add a little bit more meat to the existing chapters, explain some things a bit better. Well, you, um, you could put Angela Beach in there. She'll, like, take up some pages. I can't uh, I can't put Angela Beach in there and because uh, <laughs> I already have a character named Angel for one and for oh. two. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just... Not I'm not getting into it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm probably using up all my hotspot. I have such crappy internet where I live in this remote place that I can't even use the internet to do Zoom calls. I have to use my phone's hot as a hotspot. <laughs> Crazy. That is rough. Well, yeah. yeah. So that's fair enough. So is that uh, your way of saying we need to wrap up? Yeah. It's like... It's been very fun talking to you, though. I appreciate that. I've enjoyed the conversation as well. Anytime, anytime I'm engaged enough to start going off on tangents and rabbit holes, that means it was a fairly entertaining conversation. Okay. Well, I'm definitely going to listen to that soundtrack. That sounds. Oh, brilliant. like I said, do it. It's six hours of, it's six hours of immersive good time, and it's it's perfect for high fantasy and dark gothic style writing, which is obviously very much you. So. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, hey, what, end of interview plug. Can't forget this. Uh, where, right. where do people go to find you? Where, what should they buy? What should they follow? All that good stuff. I'll show you the. the I've got this cover thing on my wall. They want to look for this book, although that's backwards. Um, <laughs> Apothecary. It's at Amazon. It's Barnes and Noble um, online. It's on all the online bookstores, and right now on anchor.fm or any podcast um you know thing that you use for podcasts you can listen to apothecary for free it's my halloween gift for my readers to introduce this series yeah so, i saw that i saw that mentioned on your website i was oh that's kind of a cool idea that might yeah. be something i toy with in the future because that's that's a fun idea i love listening to books while i'm doing something else it's just really i love that medium for some reason you know 
I'm not the biggest fan of audio books, but I like listening if I want to listen to something while I'm doing something and I, for whatever reason, I'm tired of music. I like lectures or like pot or like discussion podcasts where people are talking about stuff. But for some reason, when it's a story, I like sitting down with a paper copy and reading it. That's my preferred way of consuming stories, um, at least in, in terms of books. And then obviously digital reading on a screen is, uh, second to that because sometimes you you I can't get a paper copy well you know why do you like you like lectures is because you never got to go to school oh no i went to high school I went oh you to, did i went to yeah i was just i was homeschooled up until high school because in the state of washington where i um was raised you can homeschool your kids without a teaching degree but then if to to have them get their high school degree you have to have a teaching certificate and my mom and neither my mom or dad had a teaching certificate so i had to go to high school to get my diploma oh oh okay yep yeah all the fun the fun years and oh god i I tell you when you talk about culture shock a kid who grew up around older adults because my my dad is old my dad had me when he was like 40 something um so growing up around much older adults and never being exposed to kids much and then being dropped into high school <laughs> culture shock let me tell you yeah wow so patricia okay. simpson it's been a pleasure the book is apothecary book one of the londo chronicles all of the stuff will be linked down in the description i link social media places you can go to buy the book so i'm gonna hunt all that down and link that down in the description <clears throat> It has been a pleasure. I appreciate all the rabbit holes. <laughs> we all, we we did go off on some pretty some pretty sizable tangents there. So uh, it's been great, Zach. Thank you for um, having me on your show. I uh, really like. It. Yeah, I, I thank you for coming on and thank you for the free book. And once I have time freed up on my docket and I'm not absolutely swamped with the stuff I have to read. I probably will come back and revisit the Londo Chronicles just because I'm curious. So do me a favor and keep writing that and fill in all these things that we've discussed today because I want answers, damn it. And send me your arc. Oh, yes, yes. Um, When I get that done, I will, like I said, I'll add you. I'm actually going to make a note. P. P. Simpson. Right, yeah. P. Simpson arc. And I will get that because I... I especially value the input of people who also engage in the craft because you have a different perspective than someone who's purely a reader. And so it's valuable input to be sure. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll catch some of your dangling participles for sure. <laughs> Hopefully my editor grabs all those. <laughs> I like working with her so far. I'm, I'm impressed with her work so far. All righty. Okay, bye-bye and take care of yourself. Best wishes, be well. Keep writing.